Hello and welcome to SCORE USMLE. Today we'll be studying the spinal pathways. In this video, we will be learning some of the spinal cord basics. In the following videos, we'll read about the ascending and descending tracts in detail and the diseases of the spinal cord. And towards the end, we will practice some of the USMLE style questions. So to begin with, let's look at this picture right here. There's the brain with the brain stem. And this cylindrical structure below it is the spinal cord. Now the spinal cord rests in the vertebral canal as shown right here. That's the vertebral canal. And this yellowish structure that you see here, you're right, is the spinal cord. So let's take a slice of the spinal cord right here and let's see what that looks like. So this is what we are expecting to see. Now I want to bring your attention to this central H-shaped structure right here in the cut section of the spinal cord. That is known as the gray matter. And the peripheral whitish surrounding area of the cut section shows us the white matter. Now what constitutes the gray and the white matter? Let me take you to the very basics of the nervous system that is the neuron. Now you can see this is a typical neuron with dendrites labeled right there and the cell body. Then there's an axon and then the myelin sheath and then the axon endings. You can see all those parts in the diagram. Now I want you to know very very clearly what parts are gray and what parts are white. So the cell body is gray as I've already mentioned here. The axon is gray too and the axon endings are always gray. Don't worry about them. But what is white? It's the myelin sheath. Now what makes the myelin sheath white? It's the lipids in the myelin sheath that make it white. So let's come back to this diagram right here. So now that we know what parts of the neuron are gray and what parts are white, we should be able to guess what constitutes the gray matter and what constitutes the white matter. So you're right, the gray matter will be constituted by the cell bodies of the neurons. And what about the unmyelinated, the unmyelinated axons? You're right, they don't have the myelin sheath, so they will be gray. What about the white matter? So, absolutely, the myelinated axons. So you see, the gray and the white matter are constituted by those things, those parts of the neuron. So let's move on and look at this diagram right here to learn about the landmarks of the spinal cord in this cut section. So you have to know that this is the anterior surface right here, marking it A. And this is the posterior surface, marking it P. So in the posterior surface, if you look at this median longitudinal depression, it is known as the posterior median fissure. And this column, this posterior white um, column, is known as the posterior white column, right? And what about the central H-shaped gray matter? So there's a posterior gray horn, which is narrow, and then there's an anterior gray horn, which is pretty broad. Then we come to the anterior surface and you can look at this anterior median sulcus. This is a huge depression. It's a cleft in the anterior surface of the spinal cord. It's a longitudinal cleft and it's known as the anterior median sulcus, right? And what about this crisscrossing that is labeled as anterior white commissure? Guys, this is where the white axons, the myelinated axons of the spinal cord cross over to the opposite side. But we'll talk about that in detail in the following lecture. And here comes the central canal. Now the central canal is the cavity through which the cerebrospinal fluid flows. And it is be, it'll be interesting for you to know that the central canal is continuous superiorly with the fourth ventricle. And that is the lateral white column. So moving on and coming to a very interesting slide where we can learn the working of the spinal cord and the pathways and especially the spinal nerve. So if you look right here, you will see this is the cut section of a spinal nerve. Now, as most of you might remember, spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. What do I mean by mixed? So a mixed nerve has both the sensory and the motor components, just like the spinal nerve does. So the other thing that you need to remember is that the motor root is always anterior or ventral, as shown here. The blue root is the motor root, while the sensory root is always dorsal or posterior. Now talking about the sensory root, 
we need to see what kind of a neuron lies in the sensory root. Now, this is a bipolar neuron that lies in the dorsal root of the spinal nerve. What is so special about it? It is bipolar. It has two exons. Now, this is different from the typical neuron that we saw a couple of minutes earlier. So, the exon number two is right here. And there's only one cell body for both of these exons, right? So, what happens really is that when the receptor fires, this exon picks this piece of information or impulse and shoots it in the direction of the cell body, while the other exon takes this information and shoots it away from the cell body of the neuron towards the next neuron which is waiting for that piece of information. Now you also see there's this wobbly head-shaped cell body of this bipolar neuron. It is the collection of these cell bodies of the bipolar neurons that accumulate together to form this dorsal root ganglion. You see there's a swelling right there that happens because of the collection of the nerve cell bodies of the bipolar neurons. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, I've heard a lot about a ganglion being different from a nucleus. What is the difference? Now, let me show you. Bringing you to, the, to this slide, this is a very rough diagram of showing the brain, which is a part of the CNS, then the spinal cord, which is also a part of the CNS, and the cranial nerves, which is a part of the peripheral nervous system, and the spinal nerve, which is a part of the peripheral nervous system again. Now, what happens really is that if there's a collection of neuron cell bodies anywhere along the CNS, that is anywhere along the brain or the spinal cord, it will be called a nucleus. That will be a nucleus. But what about a collection of neuron cell bodies along the PNS, the peripheral nervous system? That would be called a ganglion. Exactly how we called it a ganglion in this diagram right here, the dorsal root ganglion. So, moving on from there. Now, let's presume a very interesting scenario. So, let's say that you're sitting in the neuroanatomy classroom of your medical school. And let's presume the sensory receptor that I've shown here is the vibratory sensation receptor in your pocket, in your skin. So, let's say the cell phone in your pocket starts to vibrate now. What happens is that this receptor gets activated, which in turn activates this bipolar neuron lying in the dorsal root of the spinal nerve. This neuron reaches the spinal cord in the dorsal gray horn and, and it turns in the posterior white column and this axon ascends to the brain. Now, this is how this sensation of something vibrating in your pocket reaches your brain where you start to interpret it as oh my cell phone is vibrating in my pocket then you consciously decide to shut the cell phone or you know just attend the call or whatever but you send the signal through the lateral white columns of the spinal cord and the axon relays onto a neuron that is lying in the anterior gray column now the the neuron, the axon of this neuron travels in the dorsal, in the ventral root of the spinal nerve and supplies the effector muscle. What happens is that the muscles of your upper limb contract and relax in a particular order to help you grab that cell phone in your pocket. Guys, do you realize that's the effector muscle being innervated? This is how the pathways work. Now, I may have cited a particular example of a vibratory sense we will talk about the other sensations but this is typically how the ascending and the descending pathways in the spinal cord work now some of you might argue with me saying oh sir there's also an interneuron lying here now i agree with you there is an interneuron lying there and it has its own role in the spinal reflex arc but we are talking about the spinal ascending and the descending pathways here. So we do not need the interneuron to create more confusion. So what we are going to do is do a very great job about of forgetting that interneuron for the purposes of this video. So in the coming video, we will read the ascending and the descending tracks in detail.